Yes. Yes. Okay, good. Well, I'm David, and next to me is Amanda. Uh, Lovely to meet you both. Thank you. You can see the screen over here, but maybe it would also be fun if we uh, turn the screen so we can be there with the audience if you would like to. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah that's, that's good. Better, I think. So you're in Arizona? I am in Scottsdale, Arizona. It's a beautiful um, former resort community, and it's uh, a lovely, lovely area. People usually come here during the winter months from the East Coast or from Chicago area because it's so beautiful in the wintertime. All right. Um, maybe it would be, at the moment, a nice idea if we introduce the speakers and let them say a little bit about what they've talked about this, this morning. Certainly. So you can you can start. I can, I can, I can kick off. <laughs> Hello, Natasha. Um, hi. Hi. I spoke a little bit this morning about um, my personal view on immortality from a very personal perspective, and about some uh, possible moral and ethical implications that I might see arise. And I expressed my wish to go from short-term thinking to long-term thinking, <coughs> so we can anticipate uh, what I believe is coming in uh, immortality. The uh, next speaker was uh, uh, Ari Mankhaz. What did you know him? Yes. Yeah, I'm sorry, my pens are not working. I'm digging in my drawer to find a working pen to take notes. I'm sorry. Hi, Arjun. How are you? Right. Good to see you. Good to see you. Um, so I made my slides yesterday. So yeah, I yes. go through them at a fairly high rate. Uh, but it was basically sort of an intro um, for people who were unfamiliar with the set of sort of technologies that are underlying some of the transhumanist thinking, and then some concerns about the whole sustainability of it all. Um, so really, I, I think we sort of laid a, laid a bit of the groundwork for all the speakers that came after us, including uh, uh, including you. Um, so, but we've left most of the real introduction about sort of. The transhumanist thinking and the history of the, of the movement to you, yeah. uh, since you are the real expert here. So uh, that's uh, that's your job to think in closing. Okay. All <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Arjun. All right. And, uh, uh, Boris. The next speaker is Boris Sala. Hello, Natasha. Hello, Boris. I uh, I came to talk about the practical uh, application of. Uh, Things like C60 olive oil, cyclohexogenol, resveratrol, uh, and applicating to uh, athletes and see what, what will happen when you use that in your sports. Will you get stronger? Will you get more uh, cardiovascular endurance and that kind of stuff? And also why I'm doing it. So uh, not only for longevity, but also for staying healthy longer. Okay, and, and you mentioned olive oil. What was the other? Um, uh, C60. 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 Yes, of course. Okay, great. Okay. Okay, good. Right. So you're an athlete. Yeah, yeah, I try to be. Good, good, yeah. good. <laughs> okay. Excellent. Nice to see you talk. <laughs> Thank you. Okay. And uh, the last speaker uh, who is here physically present is DDA Cornell from the Here Fields organization. Hello, Natasha. Hello, good to see you. Yeah, we will see you again uh, in real life uh, in one month, a little bit in one month, more than one month in uh, Paris. Eh? Okay. So, uh, yeah, 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 I gave a uh, talk about uh, uh, political and social consequences of a longer life, what would happen if the uh, people in the street and the political leaders uh, would uh, understand that uh, we can uh, only live uh, longer. Um, with the uh, new uh, medical technologies and uh, what would be the, their reactions and, and what would be the uh, main consequences, especially concerning uh, violence and non-violence and uh, concerning economic and uh, environmental aspects. Great. Yeah. Good. Thank you. And, of course, Aubrey is not here to tell you what he has talked about, but he gave us... <laughs> 
Okay. Yeah, he gave us in the first half uh, more of a standard general uh, talk that he, I think, usually does yeah. with slides. But then later on, he, he shared his recent one. work. Yes. Perhaps you could say something about that, but it was very <laughs> technical. <laughs> and I was afraid it was a little bit too technical for me as well. Some new things uh, he also included, uh, not published yet research. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it was, it was very interesting, but um, he was at the airport, so there were some funny moments there. <laughs> Oh, I bet there was. Oh, that's great. <laughs> yeah. 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 What we notice in Holland or in the Netherlands, uh, some people say, well, it's because we just don't have that many people, but still, <laughs> but, but still I, think, I, think, I think that uh, transhumanism is not that well known. No. Every time I, I mention the word, people don't understand what it is, and sometimes people have fear from, from uh, I think, also... Uh, movies that show the, the negative side of technology. Yeah. So, and, and I think technology is a double-edged sword. Uh, and I think you're really active in showing the world what we can do if we use technology on an ethical basis. But maybe you can just introduce the, the phenomenon and the uh, philosophy of transhumanism. Certainly, certainly. Please. Thank you. Thank you. The idea of transhumanism is basically about the evolution of humans, and it, it's inconsequential whether, whether or not that evolution is based on one technology or another, one science or another, or a natural survival of the species. Our species has been surviving odds for a very, very long time, and whether you are a Darwinian or have a different particular theoretical and pragmatic view on evolution, what we're looking at now is that it is occurring. So all the views, how diverse they have been in the past, can now come together and carefully assess where we are, what's going on, and how we can build a more sustainable future for our species. Now, if our species becomes something other in the postmodernist sense, then that's the way it will be. But it doesn't mean that we relinquish, that we give up our sense of uh, dignity about being human, our sense of, of ownership of our lives, our personhood, our ethical and moral um, victims that we've developed in our various cultures around the world. We're not just one people. We're one species, to be sure. But we are so diverse throughout the world in who we are as humans, in our belief system, our traditions, our values and how we assess the past historically and our future. I think one of the most important aspects of transhumanism in this regard is that it understands the mosaic of the human, the mosaic of our backgrounds, as I said, and that this mosaic needs to continue. We don't want to become a homogenous species, everyone looking exactly the same and being exactly the same. That's a misnomer. The idea is to increase our understanding, our knowledge of who we are, to increase our understanding of the universe, our solar system, our galaxy, our universe, and to understand both the hardcore sciences of astrophysics, for example, and molecular uh, nanotechnology, and other um, hard sciences, the physical sciences, and also human nature, our psychology. So transhumanism, generally tries to bridge this gap between the hard sciences and the soft sciences through a philosophical lens, and that is a worldview, that we can indeed take responsibility for ourselves, our personhood, our families, our groups, our villages, our cities, our countries, our nations, our continents, our globe, as people in attempting to work together. It's not easy, but it can be done. I think the greatest thinkers, like Buckminster Fuller, who was the architect and designer, who came up with the idea of the world game plan, had it right when he said it's not a matter of supplies, it's a matter of distribution. That we have what it takes, we have the intelligence and the capabilities, and we're innovators as a species, we love to problem solve. So we have that, and that's, that's our, our amulet, or our, our safety net, that we are curious individuals, and we engage in understanding uh, how we can address the unknown. So that's in our, our pocket.
to give you a codified definition of transhumanism, here's my book. And it's the Transhumanist Reader. I co-edited with uh, Max Moore. And we have 42 authors in it. And it's the... Um, it's a foundation for anyone who wants to learn about the ideas of transhumanism, meaning the science, the technology, and the philosophical uh, outlook. And it says here, and I'm just going to read it for you because I think this is so concise. Transhum transhumanism, excuse me, transhumanism developed as a philosophy that became a cultural movement and is now regarded as a growing field of study. Transhumanism arrived during what is often referred to as the postmodernist era although it has only a modest overlap with postmodernism. Ironically, transhumanism shares some postmodernist values, such as need for change, reevaluating um, re knowledge, recognition of multiple identities, and opposition to sharp classifications of what human and humanity ought to be. Nevertheless, transhumanism does not throw out the entirety of the past because of a few mistaken ideas. And it goes on to talk about the Enlightenment, humanism, the religions, the worldviews are necessary for under us to understand the scope of humanity. And um, I think one of the most important aspects here is that transhumanism is a set of philosophies about the future and humanity, um, which is based on understanding where technology is today and how we can use it in ethical ways and creative ways and innovative ways um, to look at the proactionary um, possibilities rather than precautionary. And I know in, in um, your area of the world and in Germany, Austria, there is uh, a tremendous amount of work being done in the um, precautionary aspect that we shouldn't engage techno technological change unless we can prove 100% that everything is going to be great. <laughs> you know, everything's A-OK. -okay. But that's not the way it is. No matter what technology that is innovated, there's always going to be some um, possibility for error. And we have to accept that. The uh, proactionary principle, which is written in our book, um, suggests that we need to look at both sides, not to put the burden of proof on innovation and the future of change, but to put the burden of proof on what has occurred in the past. Did it work? If it didn't, then maybe we need to do it differently. So let's be critical thinkers in assessing what is, what could be, and look at the best possible route. And here it's a bit of Occam's razor. In science, choose the resolve that is the simplest and can can approach the situation in the most uh, concise manner to get the job done. The job being done that we have to do now is to fight aging. And this ties into your other speaker's talks about immortality, uh, sustainability, um, taking care of our body and, and the biochemistry of our body and um, being better uh, with our physiology, whether we're athletes or people who just want to be healthy. Um, looking at the political issues, the uh, economy, the ethics, etc., and some new innovations in life extension um, from SENS and Aubrey. So I'd like to uh, talk around that and also address some of the issues that you have for me. Um, so I'm looking at the questions right now. I, I have a presentation I can send, but I, I thought it would be better in this instance that we just talk and have this open dialogue between us. Yes, that's what um, I would like. Yes. yes. Is that good? Yeah. Okay. I'll tell you about some... Um, I'll look at your questions and then we'll have an, an open... Just, um, okay, so what do I think a person is or mind? Um, Transhumanists, yes, we, we talk about, or not to say we, the world is talking about life extension. It's no longer just a transhumanist perspective. The world is talking about how we're living longer and how we're going to deal with it. Uh, and I'm going to bring up the Moscow Convention for Sport of Quartz since um, Boris talked about um, applications of, of certain physiological enhancements. And then I'm going to talk about being in Japan recently. Sorry, my hair is getting in my way there. Uh, Japan recently um, talking to the uh, Topos conference about what to do with so many people 65 and older, it's, 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 it's it could be a pandemic. People 65 and older need to go back into the workforce. If we're living longer, we need to think about 
the um, economics of it and the politics. So I think Ilya is, is correct there in bringing that up. And Arjun in, in setting the pace for this broad uh, scope of all the different areas that are involved. Okay, so first, what is a person? Uh, from my perspective, which is aligned with the transhumanist perspective, uh, we look at personhood as our identity, our self, who we are, the, con uh, sorry, the continuity of identity over time. Oh, so I, that each... Can I interrupt you? Sorry. Yes, of course. Um, I did not introduce to the audience that I sent you a few, oh. I sent you a few questions by uh, email. And the reason I asked you, uh, what is a person... And, and what is a mind is because in transhuman, in transhumanism, people talk about uh, mind clones and mind uploading and having copies of persons and uh, protecting a, a person and letting him live forever. And then I think, uh, what do you think is a human mind? That's why I asked you the question. So, okay, so good. now the audience knows why I asked you the question. <laughs> All right. <laughs> oh, what is a mind? A mind is the abstraction of what the brain does. The brain, as we know, is an electrical circuit, and there's a lot of goings on within the brain on this uh, electrical charges between the neurons. It's where our memory is, it's where our um, information, our knowledge is pulled from, and how our neurons function and connect can make us either sharp and aware and alert, or um, dull down and slow in our thinking, and our memory uh, is encoded in these uh, neurons, in these neural synapses in our brain, uh, it's who we are, the continuity from day to day. So when we talk about uploading and the idea of uh, extreme life extension, we want to make sure that there's a continuity between who you were yesterday, who you are today, and who you might become tomorrow. We do that every night when we go to sleep. I hope the next day I wake up and I remember, oh yeah, I'm Natasha, this is what I did yesterday. Um, so short-term and long-term and working memory are all involved here. There are certain subsets of memory in the brain. An upload would be, uh, according to Hans Morvik, would be a, a, a person, a, uh, a mind, a brain, a consciousness, an awareness that is uh, encoded in computational systems. So the neurological formations, the information within neurons would be transferred from um, cellular chemical codes into computational codes. And that's a hell of a lot of work there. That's not an easy, an easy process, but individuals are working on it. So if and when the information in the brain, these connections, these electrical connections, along with the chemistry of the connections, because it's not just the DNA and the chromosomes, you go into the RNA and then you go into the different um, specific chemicals that are reacting and sending messages, all of that, if it could be encoded into zeros and ones, for example, then that could be translated in building that person in a computational system, which would be a platform uh, autonomous substrate or substrate autonomous mind, as I call it, and uh, Randall Cohen calls it SIMS, or um, just a substrate, um, substrate uh, individual. So. That is what an upload is. It's not just like taking consciousness and uploading it. It's very specific neurological cognitive science. And it has to really tie into psychology as well. So you just, it's not just hard science. It's a tremendous amount of psychology and understanding. Not only that, it has to work with the, uh, not only the central uh, nervous system, the brain and the, and the spinal column, but also the peripheral nervous system going into our um, our nervous system through our hands and our legs, the whole body, the whole system, and what I call the exo-peripheral nervous, nervous system, which would be our devices that we're using outside our body. So we're not just within our brain as a abstraction of what the brain does. Our devices that we're connecting with, our smartphones, <coughs> our mouse, our <laughs> keyboard, anything, any device that we're using that is taking information that we're transmitting through the internet, through you know, just um, the world at large, through the atmosphere, that is an extension of our uh, our physiology and our cognition. So again, I call it the exoperiphal uh, nervous system, and I think that that is going to become consequential to the future of life extension. So it's not just this body, this brain inside here; it's what we're expanding outside ourselves. All right, thank you. Can I ask two uh, sub questions? I think. Sure. 
in a way you already answered it, but just to be uh, sure, because okay. many times when I introduced what you just told us in a shorter way, uh, pe people still ask me uh, about religious stuff, like, do you believe in a soul? So that's for okay, the question. Good. <laughs> yes, good question. No, I think this is a really uh, good question. I've got one right here. It's on the bottom of my shoes. <laughs> A little bit of humor is always good in these heavy conversations. So, what is a soul? Okay, what is a soul? Uh, a soul is a way that we understand our identity, our awareness, our consciousness, so that when we die or dead matter, you know, in the ground or burned or whatever happens, that there is something left that we can align ourselves with. So someone that we love passes away. Someone that we love dies that there's something that we can nurture and, yes, cling to, because we love each other. And you love someone who dies, you want that memory. But that memory is in your brain. Okay, so what does that mean? Does that mean there is no extra peripheral central nervous system? No, it does not. In fact, we don't know. No one knows. And anyone who says they know is wrong. That's we don't very, know. That's very honest of you. Yeah, well, I don't know. You know, it's like, I like to think that yeah, I could be, I could live for a very long period of time um, in multiple platforms, multiple substrates, in this real-time physical agent that I'm in, also in an avatar in a um, cybernetic environment, also in some other form that I don't even know yet. And the reason I designed Primo Post Human, the whole body prosthetic, uh, which acts as a routing system between an upload and a download in the physical world and also virtual worlds and telepresence, etc., is because I don't know. I think we need to be in touch with the material world um, as a safety net. Could you explain more about what you just mentioned? Uh, was your project a few years ago? Yes, yes, okay, sure. Um, I have images that you can look at. Um, I think probably the best thing that you could uh, add to this um, this uh, expose would be the video. There is a video on YouTube. I can send you the link to it, but uh, it says everything in it. Primo Post Human, which I um, I've changed the name of it since then, but it was Primo Post Human in 1997. I I saw a gap. I saw that people want to live longer, but their bodies weren't keeping up. Sometimes their brain would keep up, as in ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease, which was the recent um, the bucket situation you're familiar with, right? The bucket, ice bucket yeah. situation. Okay, so um, there a fundraising, great fundraising for Lou Gehrig's disease, uh, terrible disease. In any case, that is consequential because the brain is still active, but the body is not functioning. The body is deteriorating. So what do we do when a body deteriorates, but the brain is still functioning, your cognition is still there, your soul or your spirit or your awareness is still there? It's very tragic things, like being a locked in a, a, a prison of your body. I saw too many people when I was doing volunteer work um, as a teenager that suffered because their bodies were deteriorating. I worked at a place called Home for Incurables as a volunteer, and I developed an incredible sense of sympathy and empathy for individuals whose bodies were um, had suffered from not only injury, disease, but also aging. I thought, one day I really want to do something about this. Years passed, and the, finally the time was right where I'd been studying different technologies and medical advances, but I thought, oh, why not build a whole body prosthetic? Prosthetics had advanced to such a degree that robotics and art, narrow artificial intelligence had been working with prosthetic parts, with haptics as well, um, so that a person could pick up a cup and feel the heat in a cup with a robotic <laughs> prosthetic arm, for example. We now see people in sports um, and at the Olympics, the Paralympics, uh, individuals who have prosthetic legs running. Uh, so we are going to see more and more of these prosthetic parts that function as well as biological limbs, but even better than biological limbs, that are integrated with the brain so that the brain is sending signals back and forth so you can feel the heat or the coolness of a cup, for example. Prosthetics started advancing in 1997, so I was doing my research and I thought, okay, we need a whole body prosthetic, especially for people 
again, who need a different type of body, and as well as uh, individuals who had signed up for uh, cryopreservation, who at one time, if they are revived, would have a body other than the, um, the old body that had deteriorated. I designed prenatal post human um, as a whole body prosthetic. It is a whole body, and you would upload your brain into it or transfer the brain into it, and it would function as a real body, as a it would in the real in the physical material world, looking like a human body, but it would be designed with nano technology, artificial general intelligence. Uh, synthetic artificial skin, for example, have a spinal column that would be continually communicating with the brain of what's going on in the body. It would have replaceable parts. I saw it as a vehicle that could be upgraded and, and um, refined and, and um, returned and developed. I used the car as a, a, a metaphor for it. But as time went on, I started seeing this is, is really working. It was so tremendously successful. It was written up in so many magazines and newspapers, TV shows, etc. that I thought, okay, here's something great, but it was before its time. Um, prosthetics had not advanced there, and it still hasn't advanced to where we have full body yet, but it, it's, it's coming. You're, you're seeing that henceforth, torsos, whatnot. I changed the name of it um, in 2010 to be Platform Diverse Body and Substrate Autonomous Person. The reason is that I don't want to rely just on specific technology like nanotechnology, for example, for this whole body. So I want it to be platform diverse, meaning that whatever system it's in would work real time, biosphere, cybersphere, uh, telepresence, virtual worlds, artificial worlds, etc. So um, the issue here that ties into your previous question, the reason why I started working on the, the area of the mind uh, is because of memory. And that part I changed as a separate sub-project sub called Substrate Autonomous Mind. And I've been doing my research, which I'll talk about in just a moment, on memory. Um, so the idea that if it's the person that is going to be living longer, um, indefinitely, let's say, that radical life extension, that we want to ensure that that, that is sustained as carefully and safely as possible. So ethics really is an important factor here. I think I answered that question. <laughs> no, let me know. Yes, you did. did. Did I send you any more questions? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Um, okay. Um, you say if you only copy your brain, you miss the influence of fluctuating hormones, etc. Now, this ties into the central nervous system, which I think is consequential. It's not just an upload of the brain. Okay. It's the whole system. Okay. So uh, there is a, certainly a discrepancy with those who say, oh, let's just copy the brain and upload it. I do not agree at all. I think our physiology, our experiences, our sensorial mix are so important to us. They form who we are. Exactly. So how things taste, how they smell, how they feel the sensuality and sexuality of our species is valuable to us. Will it be valuable in the future? Maybe in a different way. But why? Why cast it aside as inconsequential and say we'll just be an upload of a computational system? No, that, that, no. I do not agree with that at all. So, that it becomes more complex. Maybe it'd be easier just to copy, you know, the function of the neurons in the brain. And it becomes more complex to think about the other, other information but let's keep in mind that all that information does go to the brain. Everything that you feel and smell and touch does go to the brain. So it all is encapsulated in the brain. But what we would need in the case of an upload would be a body. That it's not just going to be, a, as Catherine Hale said, a disembodied entity or agent floating around in cyberspace. No, that's a we will always have some type of system, body, let's call it no matter what environment we're in, because we experience the world around us. And even if it's in a computational system, we will have a new sense of senses or uh, experiences. You asked me about um, how can we make a perfect copy of a human. I don't believe in perfection. Let me say that right up front. Uh, for those individuals who say, oh, transhumanists are just looking for perfection. No, that's not true. And the reason, it's very logical. This is kind of a no-brainer if you think about it a little bit. Get away from society saying, oh, we all want to be perfect and this and that. 
Perfection means that you reach a point where there's no nothing else. There's no further. There's no furtherance. You reach a point of stasis. The transhumanist scope is to continue forward to reassess, reevaluate. It's an iterative process. It's very much like design. Design is iterative. No matter what stage design is at, looking for ways to change it because time changes us. Our tools change. So we have to be in the mode of change. So I look at it more as a cybernetic system, uh, feedback control. And um, so there's not one end point. It's constantly changing and our values do change over time. Okay, another question is, can cyber bodies be sensual and attractive? Yeah. <laughs> but here's a, here's a difference between the cyborg and the transhuman, and oftentimes it gets confused. Cyborg stems from um, Matthew Klein and A.D. Klein. They coined the term cyborg based on space exploration. During the 1950s, cybernetics, etc., Norbert Weiner, a lot was going on, especially at the University of Illinois earlier on with uh, Von Forster, who created the Brain Computer Interaction Laboratory, which was heavily funded at one time and then dissolved. So this area has been explored for quite some time. Out of cybernetics, the idea of the cyber arose, but it wasn't based on what um, Steve Mann or, or um, Kevin Woolworth see it today, or even in the philosophical postmodernist world. The cyborg originally was for space exploration because our human bodies would be too uh, vulnerable out in zero G and with the effects of, of sun radiation. So we needed some other type of uh, envelope around us to protect us if we were to go into space, but we haven't. <laughs> Still at this time, don't at all. But uh, hopefully, hopefully. So that's the cyborg. Now the transhuman is looking at the health and well-being of the human species for living longer and integrating with technology. So those are two different concepts. The transhuman is not interested in putting gadgets, devices on ourselves and staying human and dying at 85, 82, 85, and just, you know, staying like that. The transhuman is looking at integrating these devices, whether we wear them, or they're intrusive, added to our bodies as a nanomedicine, and we extend our life for longer periods, so we're defying the genetic blueprint of the human species that is limited by 122, let's say approximately years. Extending that, increasing certain aspects of ourselves, our physiology, our cognition, because we've already been doing that. My computer it has, and Google has certainly increased my intelligence. <laughs> I'm constantly researching. Before I had to go to the library and, and you know schedule the time to get to the library to do research. Now I, I just do it as you know, second hand, not a big deal. So we've already become smarter, meaning not necessarily our, our IQ has changed. It's just that our level of information has grown. So the cyborg and the transhuman are different in that regard. So the, the cyber is also looked at this metal type of cold, you know, terminator creature. I think a Schwarzenegger with the cyborg. But the transhuman, the reason I designed Primo Post Human, a platform diverse body, substrate autonomous mind, looking like a human, is because I intentionally was marketing it that way. I did not want it to come across as this cold, metal, hard, indifferent agent or body. So I was very... Um, clear about that just to start out. I think we can become a more loving uh, species. Uh, what we want uh, from the transhumanist perspective is a greater sense of humaneness, a greater humanity based on what is humanity. So we've got a lot of conflict as humans to be sure. Um, we're still dealing with the reptilian part of our brain, you know, fight or flight, anger, defense, anger, you know, uh, you know competition, envy, jealousy, greed, all these different, you know, seven deadly sins. Why are we still dealing with this, for goodness sakes? Why are we still knee-jerk? Why are we still fighting over religion? And um, so, uh, okay, you asked me about uh, the predictions, the famous predictions of Ray Kurzweil and Dimitri and stuff. Um, well, Ray's, Ray Kurzweil's predictions. Um, are, I, I, he uh, developed his ideas about the singularity based on Bruder Vinci's supposition, who um, created the idea of the singularity. 
So I would have to go to Werner Vinci on that. Um, and there's several different views of the singularity. Is that the, the question there? Okay. Yeah, actually, yeah. Uh, okay. Um, Kurzweil thinks in his, his prediction that um, it'll be a major alteration, that all of a sudden we will live for greater periods of time, that we will be uploaded, that we will um, become something other than, than human. And I think that's totally possible. I, I don't see any problem with that at all because it's, it, that's the direction we're heading. So the issue here is the singularity. Will it be one, you know, hitting the wall and everything will be different? Now, for your, your, uh, uh, your colleagues here, I'm sure all of you know what the singularity is, so I don't need to go over that, correct? Uh, no, thank you. I would like if you explain a little bit about it. Sure, sure. Okay, the singularity is, but it's a, first, the singularity is a term used in physics, uh, astronomy, uh, astrophysics. But in the world of technology and society, the singularity has meant a time when computer intelligence has developed to a point it has increased far, far beyond human level intelligence. So what it is, is a super intelligence. Not only that, the superintelligence has consciousness. So it's aware, becomes self-aware. So the humans would no longer be the most intelligent species on the planet. So that is a whole paradigm shift right there. So the singularity is, um, now there's several different views, uh, theoretical views on it. One, Werner Benji, that we hit a wall. That we wake up and we're no longer, you know, the smartest in the hierarchy of intelligence, if that's, I think that's, it's important, but you know, there's so many different levels of intelligence. So in the level of intelligence and formation of knowledge that the computers have outsmarted us so far, we wake up and go, oh, we've hit a wall. Okay, another type of singularity would be the Kurzweil singularity. He talks about accelerating change, uh, exponential growth, etc. So that we're leading that way, he can track it. So he's seeing where Moore's law fits in and computational power is, is advanced and advanced. And these other sciences and technologies are coming in and it's hitting different points so that the singularity is something that we are, whether intentionally or non-intentionally, that we're, we are creating. It is happening. So he's mapped it in that sense. There's other views. Um, for example, there is the view of the surge that the singularity is not going to be just one, you know, you hit it and we wake up the next day and, whoa, or that we can track it. We can't track things. No one can predict the future. That's impossible. So predictions, by and large, in and of themselves, are a fallacy. We don't know. Anything can happen. There are tipping points, unintended consequences, you know, markets fail, the economy changes, wars occur, the planet sneezes. <laughs> Anything can happen. So the idea of the surge makes more sense because it's happening in waves and you can see the waves. And eventually we will get to the point, more likely than not, that computers will develop superintelligence. And possibly computers will develop awareness. It's feasible. So um, now Dimitri is looking at immortality and using a system of avatar. So where we upload into an avatar and exist in a computational system. The problem I have with that, and I, 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 both these, uh, both Dimitri and Ray are individuals who I, I like very much and um, I respect highly. And I think it's important that we have various views because we, are, we don't follow each other. We are all, you know, it's, it's that, um, um, Mighty Python, um, you know, about each one of us has to decide for ourselves what our belief system is based on our own research, our own level of, of morals and the ethical uh, opportunities and resolve. So um, the idea of being immortal, I don't use the term immortality for a couple of reasons, but mainly because we don't know nothing can exist forever, or maybe it can. You know, there's the question, does it or doesn't it? We think of the, is the universe collapsing on itself or is it expanding? We know that the sun has a, a lifespan, but it will dissolve and, and become something else, so there's this evolution. In astrophysics, astronomy, cosmology, the universe has its own aging process, 
and um, to assume that we can live forever and ever and ever, it's, it's too big of an abstraction to grasp. But, so I use the, the phrase radical life extension, extreme, um, a super longevity, um, indefinite lifespans, etc. So I think that uh, Dimitri is, is correct that we will have avatar types bodies, uh, mainly because I designed one, and the film Avatar I think is a, is a, a great example of, of that type of scenario. But well, let's keep in mind that it's based on electricity, right? True. What if someone pulls the plug? You pulled the plug on Aubrey today. <laughs> <laughs> so it's <was> like, oops, <laughs> sorry. Yeah. What happens if the energy source that is fueling the environment collapses? We, our energy source that's fueling this environment and our planetary system is the sun. What if the sun collapses? We see solar flares. What if something were to go wrong with the sun? We're doomed. So I think that the issue here, which all of your speakers have touched on, are the life extension, the consequences, the ethics, the sustainability, uh, keeping our bodies healthy and fit, I mean, the athletes of our lives for longevity, the, the political issues, the economic issues, and new uh, discoveries are, are essential. Um, oh, here's a great question. Oh, yeah, if you want to interrupt me, please do. Uh, I'm interruptible. <laughs> Just want to welcome you. Uh, wil iemand tussendoor even wat vragen? Ja, ik heb wel wat vragen. Uh, are your ideas, do you think... Uh, zou je misschien uh, naar de microfoon naar de camera willen lopen? Dan uh, kan je het verstaan. Misschien wil je ook even voorstellen wat je doet. Hi. 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 I'm uh, Tim Christian, I'm a journalist and a writer. And I write also about life extension. And I was just wondering uh, your ideas. Uh, are they just a concept, or do you believe that they are feasible, that they will be realized in, in, in our own lifetime? It's an excellent question. Thank you for asking. I think that I would have to reveal my age to answer that. But in our lifetime, we do this as those of us in the group, both of us have a few gray hair. What we can do, and I, I really think this is essential, I don't think everything that I have envisioned for the future will occur during my lifetime. I'm very pragmatic. I'm not Pollyanna about any of this stuff. But I think it will occur. The best way to be a part of it is to stay healthy, to exercise, surround yourself with people who love you and who you love, have a passion in life, a purpose. Uh, work, have a job, don't sit around. You know, If you're depressed, get a nootropic or go on a serotonin uptake re-inhibitor. You know, uh, seek out the resolve to any conflicts we have on a physical, emotional, mental level, and um, protect ourselves. The, the sustainability comes from us, individual, because we all know in the deepest, darkest hours of our lives where our problems are and what we need to do. Um, I think that the best way to uh, be a part of this um, radical life extension, super longevity, immortality, whatever term we call it, is to be healthy, as I said, and also to um, sign up for a chronic preservation. Because at least the technology for cryonics offers a safety net, and it's all we have. And I've researched this so thoroughly that looking at all the different promises and opportunities and potentialities, chronics is here now. The process for crowd preservation is really advanced. The liquid nitrogen, the uh, crowd um, uh, preservation process, the, um, the methods for uh, protecting cells from uh, crystallization or fracturing and, and freezing that's uh, been addressed with certain um, protectants. So I think that's the, the best for us today. Okay. But honestly, you no. Know, yeah, I'm one of those people that may just be at the, the edge, but I, if, if you, so... If you would give us a percentage, how, 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 how much per percent chance do you think that you will be alive uh, 1,000 years from now? 1,000 years is a very far future. I think that there is a good chance that if I have a good preservation, 
if my brain is still sharp and I, I, I undergo the, uh, the medical surgery quickly after my pronounced death, that I would have a fairly good chance of being resuscitated, revived, and I would be um, with nanomedicine and uh, a lot of reliance on nanorobots going in and, and repairing cell damage, etc., and being uh, having my uh, my brain, whether it's in wet matter or or another system, another substrate, put into a whole body prosthetic. I think it's it's fairly likely. Uh, percentage, I don't like to do percentages, but in, in all respect to you, since you're asking, I would say there's a 50 50 chance. Oh, wow. And my last question, and I will leave you to sure. the rest, is um, um, what if you uh, wake up uh, 500 years from now, mm -hmm. but you're the only one who made it from our generation? Yeah. Oh, just like anyone. My mother, who's living with us right now, is 96, and she's the only one left. My father passed away, her family, um, her besides her children, all gone. So it must be very difficult for all the people today who are alive that have lost their spouses, all their friends, their parents. They're like, they're, they are like the soldiers the canaries in the cage for what the rest of us could be experiencing. So they are a valuable asset to the rest of us. And our nurturing of them and understanding of them could help ourselves understand what we could be going through. I mean, I see my mother, so she says, I'm the only one left. She, all her friends are gone. So she is a different mentality and spirit. She tries to wake up each day and sing a song and read, and she's an avid reader, so she tries. And I think that is set, um, an example for me of, of don't complain and whine about it, you get on with life. And there is so much value and preciousness to being alive. If someone wants to die and is not interested in, in life, that's their choice. For those of us who, for whatever reason, just love life, and you know, there are some people who just love life and just want to continue it, I think that that is our choice and, and it's, it's a great, great, oh God, I don't mean to sound better than people who don't like death. I mean, that's all fine, because if you have another world you want to go into, but there's something about the here and now that we understand about life that's precious. And those of us who are explorers of it want to see where it's going. If I woke up and I was the only one, sure, I'd be sad, of course. You know, I'd miss my husband and my friends and colleagues and my dog. <laughs> but I... I have such um, a curiosity for life, I'd, I'd want to just continue. So it may just be a, a psychology of the explorer. I don't know, but excellent questions. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. I have another question at the moment. Uh, or, sorry. Yeah. Well, we have another one. Okay. Her name is Case, right? Hi, Natasha. Hi, hi. You got a nice name, Vita Moore. Oh, thank you. <laughs> uh, you spoke about the singularity mm -hmm. and that uh, machines or systems or computers or robots or whatever you call it will get awareness. Uh, a more uh, artificial, artificial or what you call it, or intelligence. So the machines will get. Uh, more human, or they got uh, human qualities, and it doesn't matter if we fear that or not. I think, but for me, I know a machine never can be called human, whatever. But I do fear something else, or I don't fear it. I see it happen in my society. I think machines or systems are not getting human. No, the human, the human are getting machines. That's a pessimistic view, but that's what I see around. What do you think about? I think that your view is is observant. We can certainly detect that where the human is becoming, you know, more like the machine, etc. Well, I, I think that's a totally reasonable observation about what's going on. Is it pessimistic? 
I wouldn't say so. I think it's it's. No, my my kids or my my friends they wake up and the first thing they do they they start a small uh, incredible super machine. We don't realize how sophisticated that little piece of technology already is. We walk around with credit cards with chips in it, and it's growing. Our behavior is dictated by all the technology you and I are so, so excited about. Mm -hmm. I have a different way of looking at it. I'm, my neck is starting to hurt from trying to say, excuse me, I'm just going to change this over here. Is that okay? There. Yeah. And I have to change this monitor to move you over here and this over here. It's okay, yeah, 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 now I It's a smaller angle to look at transhuman. Okay, yes, okay, will, let's, let's unpack not, this. I will not see the, the future anyway, but still it's mm. for me in a... Okay, let's, let's unpack this. First off, the tools that you're, you're, you're bringing up, these devices that we're constantly working on and etc. The human animal has always used tools, the arrow, the rock, the stone, you know, whatever it is, fire, to sustain, to stay alive. We, need, we have needed these tools to communicate, to transport ourselves, and to find food, basically, to fight the elements, to survive the elements, the arrow, the rock, whatever it is. Um, the tool of communication has been consequential to us since the first pictoglyphs in, say, Alaska, France, or wherever they were. Those were symbols, those images. That was a tool, the drawing, loading the, the um, paint across the handprint, the symbols that we use. The symbols that we're using today, if you look over time, those tools are still the way that we communicate and transport. We um, are swiping cards, you say credit cards, all this identity. I, I don't... I can see where this, you know, you see that we're becoming more mechanized, right? Um, I think that there are people who have have discarded a little bit of that sentiment, that poetic sentiment of stop and smell the roses, get out in nature, enjoy life. Yeah, I think that that is a problem. I think it's equally a problem that there are so many obese people around the world. And I travel a lot, and I see it everywhere. People overweight. That, to me, is a problem. It means they're not exercising. So you can't blame technology. I'm not saying you, but so one cannot blame technology for people not getting out and exercising. That's something that is our responsibility for being aware. It is true that many people are like, hypnotized by television and sitting down all the time in front of a computer, in front of the TV, in front of a game, a console, whatever it is. And that can be very um, damaging to not only our body, but also our thinking. <laughs> so I agree with you there. I think we need to get out and exercise more and, and be a part of life. I'm someone who skis. I love downhill skiing. Hiking's okay. I don't love it, but I love being out in nature. I love camping out. I love, um, you know, watching the um, the stars and during, you know, the uh, meteorite showers, etc. But I can't speak for everyone. I think it's more of a psychological issue than a, a mechanized one. The devices that we have for communication, transportation, are necessary and uh, truly helpful to us. It's that people are acting in a way that is not beneficial for their longevity. Maybe they don't care. I don't know. Oh, thank you very much. Uh, one You're very question, welcome. One question. Oh. I, I, don't, I don't know you very much, but did you, because I've got a hell of a lot of questions, but I, I stop here. Did you, did you write also about ethics and philosophical aspects? Yes. All right. Then I, I will read more about you. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you. <laughs> Natasha, thank you. I have another okay. question. Um, Arjen also talked about uh, the increasing uh, surveillance on the internet, for example. Yes. Everything is becoming uh, more connected, and in the future, maybe people will even be uh, half technology, half biological uh, humans, so cybernetic. And we will probably be connected to about everything that exists. Hyperconnectivity. Uh, 
do you believe we will have any sense of privacy at all in the future? And what is your opinion on privacy? Do you think it's important? Oh, <laughs> great question. Yeah, I was talking to my students about it. I have a number of students in my classes who are um, getting their degrees in security surveillance, forensic security, etc. And they say there is no such thing as privacy. So on the internet, the minute you log turn your computer on and you log in, forget it. Uh, the idea of privacy is an illusion. Uh, you can be traced anytime, anywhere, based on... Is it too dark? I can't see. Am I too dark here? No. Oh, okay. okay. Um, based on, uh, you know, what you're dialing in. You know, so there is no sense of privacy on the Internet anymore. Forget it. Anytime you use any electronic uh, device, um, and put your information in or just log on, there is no, there is no privacy. And they are very firm about this. And I said, well, what do we do? How do we counter this? They say, don't use anything. Where there's zeros and ones, that will trace you. Okay, does that mean there's not going to be any privacy? No, it does not. I am a firm supporter of privacy. And I like open source, but I like my privacy. I'm a very private person. I don't want to have all of these spread out all over the place all the time where anyone can come into my brain and change my thinking. No. With the issue of the upload and uh, existing in different type of modalities or substrates, I think it's, it's very important for us to be thinking very strongly about where can we go to drop out, as Timothy Leary said, you know, drop out, turn off, turn on, but just drop out, turn off. I need that. So with my future body design, Primo Post Human, which is now the substrate of autonomous mind and platform diverse body, it does have a device that shuts down in the physical world. I wouldn't know how to do it in other worlds because I don't exist in other worlds, but at least in the physical world to, to, to stop any type of uh, electrical intervention based on zeros and ones. That doesn't stop chemical interventions because if we are sensorial beings and all of our senses are aware, our addition, our factory, voice, touch, everything is picking up molecules and information. So you can't stop that. And it very well could be that our, our nose, our sense of smell may become um, either a means to protect ourselves by blocking out certain molecules that are transmitting information or by uh, hacking us. You know, you look at a dog, for example, who has an enormous capability for sniffing out molecules and probably visualizes them in some way that identifies one urine scent from another urine scent or one butt from another butt. You know, what are they doing? They're sniffing all the time. That's what they do. So it's like, what are they thinking when they're doing that? So it very well could be that, that chemistry is a big issue too. So I would I like the idea of privacy if and when I, I want it, um, but it may be very difficult. Is it, you know, today you don't know where your privacy is. Anyone could be peeking on you at any moment. You tell your best friend a secret. Maybe that best friend is going to tell someone else the same secret. Who can we trust? And trust has always been an issue, right? Exactly. And do you think uh, artificial intelligence should have sort of human rights as well in the future? Oh, that's a really good question. So, sentient rights. Okay. Um, yeah, yeah. So there's two different rights. There's basic human rights and there's civil rights. So civil rights are legal bound rights. You know, you're right based on whatever governance you're existing within. So those are civil. Basic human rights, the United Nations has a universal... Uh, human rights, and all the countries that are part of the United Nations agree to this, but there are many countries in the world, on the planet, that aren't part of the United Nations, and therefore may have their own set of human rights. So each government not only has the civil rights based on le legal um, qualifications, um, but also basic rights. In the United States, it's the right for uh, pursuit of happiness, etc. I think that if and when artificial intelligence, uh, intelligence, excuse me, if and when artificial intelligence develops uh, awareness that it will most certainly want to have some basic rights. I don't know if we call them human rights, civil rights, mm -hmm. but we definitely have to have some some rights. Yeah. And then, another question: What do you think are uh, the biggest threats and biggest opportunities in the coming five or ten years? Biggest threats? 
Yeah, I don't know if I'd call it terrorism. I would say angry humans desirous to kill others because of a old world brain or mind. That to me is a very big threat. That there are people on this sweet blue green planet that we exist on who want to kill other people because they share a different belief to me is it's it's not only vile. It goes against everything that those of us who want to increase our humaneness or sustain humanity care about. There are people who want to kill. So that to me is a very big threat in light of the fact of germ warfare, the issues with Ebola and you know, spreading it. These, there could be a pandemic that these people uh, instigate. So I think they are a big threat. I think it's a horrible threat. Um, and I think everyone else needs to be aware of it, and I think that the individuals who share this religious belief need to be participate and, and stop those who are a threat to the rest of us. How can we sleep at night knowing that there are people who say everyone who doesn't believe what we believe must die? That's a big threat. Okay. Um, another big threat is the... Um, well, I guess you could put that under narrow-mindedness or old-world thinking or something, but um, I think the, 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 the threat of lousy and uneducated, uh, lacking in knowledge, governance, would be disastrous to, to any hope for the future. Um, for example, and I don't devalue uh, George Pratt, uh, former President George W. Bush. I think he, he did some good things and some questionable things. I don't, you know, I feel the same about Obama. did some good things and has done a lot of questionable things. Uh, but when George W. Bush put a moratorium on stem cell <clears throat> development and put a big fine, <clears throat> excuse me, on that in the United States and built his bioethics committee, I thought it was a terrible thing, but I also understand it. Because at that time, the only way to get stem cells was through embryos, the placenta, or the umbilical cord. That means that there, it was, ethics comes in. I understand that. But what it, it, what it did was it caused some people to potentially die who could have lived if they had gotten stem cells, such as Dr. Roy Walford, who had ALS, and died of it because it, no one could work on stem cells to help them. Another example there, though, is that because of that, it caused these medical scientists to think of another way to find stem cells. And so now we know that we can obtain stem cells from our fat cells, from our own fat cells. So that issue of embryos is no longer an issue that you can get stem cells otherwise. So by putting a moratorium, it allows something else to take place. So I look at it, I look at most things at both sides of the issue. Um, but I think that a strong governance that doesn't understand the future, doesn't understand the potential and wisdom of, of advancement and innovation would be a disaster. I'm not afraid of uh, runaway nanotechnology, and I'm not afraid of artificial and in general intelligence taking over the, the planet, you know, AI-driven robots. Okay. Um, no? That's actually a problem we discussed, I think, earlier today, about mm -hmm. uh, government not being aware of uh, new and emerging technologies and the, the, the things we talked about today that concern us all about uh, longevity and, like I said, new emerging technologies. So I think it was DJ who said this, that how do we get uh, our governments to understand the importance of all these new things? How do we get them from short-term thinking to long-term thinking? Do you have any ideas on this? You know, it's interesting. Um, I really don't, but I'll, I'll discuss it with you. The, um, I tried it one time, and I'll, I'll explain it ever so briefly in just a moment, but grassroots, I'm a big supporter of grassroots, people's voice, I'm a grassroots type of woman. I think that the more we do, the others are going to pay attention. Just even transhumanism, you know, back in the 19, 1983 when I wrote the Transhuman Manifesto, uh, I was ignored by the art world, the design world, and when I was doing bio art, looking at um, the uh, life extension, et cetera, the bio artists, you know, didn't want me to be any part of them, especially those in Australia. Stellar art was different, he was cool, but most of them didn't want anything to do with me because they thought, oh, transhumanism is horrible. The, the issue here is that the work that we do, people will eventually pick up. Now, Stellark and so many bio artists are, you know, oh yeah, there is life extension. 
other people, designers, are going, oh, yeah. And you know, even you, know, you have people looking at, we are living longer. We, the nanotechnology, nanomedicine is coming about. My students are interested in this. And this is, it's so different than it was 20 years ago when uh, these ideas were dissed because we were selfish or didn't like our bodies or didn't like life or just wanted to be perfect. No, that's not it at all. So I ran in 1992. I was elected in Los Angeles County as a council person for the 28th Senatorial District, which is like Santa Monica, Marina Del Rey, going down Venice, that area of Los Angeles. And I ran on the Green Party ticket because I am an environmentalist. I'm not like a Greenpeace type person. I'm looking at the environment of the human as well as the, um, the human body, the human physiology and brain and mind, as well as the environment we live in, the whole ecology. And I thought we need technology to help sustain us. And so I, my platform was on the transhumanist perspective of future technology, science and technology, helping to build this way. I was elected. I got the most votes. It was amazing. I served uh, for the Green Party for one year, and I resigned. I did a TV show then, which was um, educational. It was just a really deep little show in Santa Monica. But I brought in futures. We talked about life extension, everything. And that was through the late 1980s to the mid-1990s. The bottom line here is I tried. You can't force people to accept your ideas. What you do is bottom up. Like bottom up AI is better than top down, in my view, because uh, and, well, it's not better. It serves a different purpose. Top down is narrow AI, and it's a function, you know, set on a goal. Bottom up, uh, bottom up uh, means that it's learning and growing like a child, and we all continue to learn. So I think that the best way to help educate individuals in in commerce and politics, and as um, Gillian was saying, in the economics and human ethics, etc., is to Keep on writing, keep on making your voices heard, um, have conferences. Davos, have you, has anyone been to the Davos conference, the economic conference? Natasha, I'm, I'm sorry to interrupt, uh, but in a few uh, minutes we will go over to the group discussion. Great, because, oh good. Because we don't really have much time anymore for this part of the section. Uh, is that oh, it's perfect. Yeah, what you uh, I'm going to hear what you all have to say. Yeah. So you would like to join the group discussion? Uh, for a few minutes, I can, yeah. and then, okay. yeah, let's see, okay. How do you feel about the group discussion now, now we're on the other side? Yeah, I think it's Engels. At the moment we're discussing how we're going to do it, since we also have oh. to... Uh, <laughs> I'll sit back it. and enjoy you all for a moment. <laughs> yeah. Is that Nederlands? No, she, she does not understand Dutch, so uh, we're switching over to English for the group discussion. Uh, and the group discussion was not just about your talk, but I think to round yes. off the day and uh, to yeah. talk about what we heard today. Uh, yeah, Jan, who, who's here for you? Oh, no. Uh, what, what are your thoughts on that? I don't have thoughts. Uh, maybe uh, the audience uh, have ideas about this uh, Something thing. Something that sticks out. Well, needs to be the thing that I can share yeah. is that uh, my thoughts when I started this project to have everybody together was that uh, on purpose I asked people from different fields uh, to come together and also from different parts of the world. Uh, so it's about uh, supplements, it's about uh, an organization like Heals uh, that brings together people from laboratories but also politics, transhumanism and uh, yeah, the, the flip side of, of technology also and not only individual uh, life extension, but if the world around you is uh, going in a bad way, then you cannot survive as an individual. So we also talked about the environment and how we can uh, become better as a society. And I think that was a great success today. And uh, what is uh, good about permanent beta is that it's an open platform and you're able to share open-minded views. And uh, I would like to thank you for that. Oh, I thank you. You did the, the work. And yeah, but, yeah, thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. <laughs> mm, so, uh, yeah, what are your thoughts today, uh, Amanda? Um, I, I thought it was very nice to hear all the, the different views. Some of it. Would you like to sit in front of the camera? As, some of them were a little bit more dark <laughs> than my views. <laughs> I'm, I'm one of the, the life enjoyer type. 
and, uh, um, so, but it was still interesting to hear because I like to be also aware of everything and all the opinions and things that are happening around me to get the whole view and not just narrow view. Um, uh, I learned a lot today, especially uh, um, about, about the more darker side. Um, I, I was a bit surprised by the Aubrey's talk. <laughs> And there were some uh, some aspects I wasn't aware of either, which I will be reading into. Um, yes, what else can I say? Um, most most interesting was actually the discussion during the talk. Also, when when we were giving talks, we were asked questions during the talks, and uh, they sparked more interesting thoughts. Um, and I would like to continue talking and thinking about later. <laughs> Arne, would you like to, to join here and um, share uh, what, what you thought of today and what you learned? Or? No, so so I, I, I think what we saw again today is that there's basically... Uh, can you uh, hear can you from your side? Yes. Move closer to the... Nice. Can you have another seat? Yeah. Um, yeah, so one of the things, and, and at first I think we've been discussing some of this stuff since, I don't know, the second Clinton administration or something like that. Um, and I, I, I saw it here again, that there, there are these two discussion strands, and there are two things, but they relate. And one is all the ideas and discussions and ethical questions about sort of the individual long liberty, and you know, how it will work, and what does it mean, and do we get permission from society, or can we go ahead without permission, and all those kinds of both sort of technical and scientific questions and ethical questions. And then there's the whole second thing, which I think over the last decade has become a bit more sort of urgent, where is the question, well, you know, we can come up with all this biotech to make individuals live longer, but if there's not, it's going to be a society and a planet that's sort of worth living on, then none of it's going to do us a lot of good. Um, and I, 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 I distinctly remember that we spoke about this back in, I think, 98, when, when, when I visited you in Max in LA, that, that it, it seems to be, and I still see this now on some of the mailing lists and stuff, that it's... Um, uh, people who come into this area tend to really start out with a more individualist approach and then as they mm -hmm. mature into the subject they tend to get a bit more perspective on, on some of the broader issues that there's no point in individual survival if there isn't a place in whatever way you want to say that that's worth living in, that's actually enjoyable to live in. Uh, so on the, on the one hand they're sort of two separate discussions because they're different things uh, but of course the one doesn't go without the other. Um, mm -hmm. So I think we need to think about that a little bit more on how to how to have those discussions because traditionally it's been fairly focused on the individual stuff, um, and, and and that should continue. So don't get me wrong on that, um, but I think we should balance it with saying, well, if it's not going to be a planet and an ecosystem that will actually carry us, then you know, despite all the biotech, we might still simply die of starvation because there's no more food production. So then none of the, none of Aubrey's work, you know, will have any meaning. Which would be a shame. So I think those are some of my sort of more darker concerns than anything. Um, uh, sort of given where we are with climate change and you know, essentially the lack of policy that we're seeing mostly in my view, um, that on, a, on the one hand we're going to need all the technology to, to fix all that because there's obviously not going to be another type of solution than a technology fix, um, but there's a real becoming real interesting whether we're going to get the stuff in time. Um, given sort of how close to how close some of these problems are, you know, we don't have another sort of 50 years to think about this, and then maybe eventually come to a conclusion. It sort of needs to happen today, in my view, or maybe a decade ago or a decade from now. But we'll, we'll know for sure in 20 years what the actual date on that is. Um, but but quite quite soon. Um, I, I I don't know. Have you seen any fundamental changes in that in the? in the sort of the broader community compared to say 15 years ago? Because I see, for instance, also the way that, that, that people like Anders and Nick talk about this now is really different from a decade ago. Well, I think that there's always been two distinct areas within um, the scope of, of this query about the future um, from the transhumanist perspective, and that's that we have to take responsibility for ourselves and not expect the government or, or 
you know, someone else to take care of us and sit on welfare and, you know, be given food stamps, etc. that we have to get out there and participate in life. And the other is that we need a world worth participating in life for. And I've been in both areas, and I, I never really felt comfortable in that one area that was more the um, objectivist perspective, the, the libertarian objectivist perspective, but I understand it uh, well. I think that the, then the strong democratic perspective um, is also flawed because it's saying that, okay, let's have government control everything and run everything, and, and let's just sit back and, and you know, take the money and not give money, not be, you know. It's just, it's, the whole thing is ridiculous. It doesn't form any system of thinking. I think Andrews has always been involved in both areas. I don't think he's been uh, someone who's uh, been a staunch, or staunch, excuse me, staunch individualist. I think he's just always looked at the world as a system as I do. Um, but when you're starting out any, any ideas um, that are to save your life, it's always going to look like you're only concerned about yourself. Because who are you but your life? You, you know? Um, so I don't see that as a problem at all. I think that more emphasis could have been and, can, and should continue to be placed on the world at large as a system, as an ecology. And I think that now is the time to do that. It's hard to be the canary in the, in the, in the cave and you're being dissed anyway because you have these ideas that, you know, it's, so you're, you're just trying to get something across. So I think in, all in all it makes sense as far as looking at existential risk as Nick does, I, I'm not someone who really looks at existential risk. I think of extinction risk. Um, I think about ecology. Um, I think that, I don't know, I, I think that it, it, it's a hard, we just need to work together and get things done. Uh, it's, I, I, I think things progress and evolve as they need to as an iterative process, but I'm a designer, so that's how I see it. You know, you, you work on what needs to be done, and then you reevaluate it, you work on what next needs to be done. Um, if we had all been working to, like the Red Cross, to save the planet and not thinking about life extension, there would be no life extension. So, um, And the, the work that Nick and Andrew's done, it, it's, it's great to be sure, but just one small area, you know, it's, it's uh, being in Oxford is fabulous. Yeah, well, they, they, they've given the whole area some uh, academic respectability, so that's been great. Uh, so just to clarify for the audience, uh, I think James Hughes has given the area incredible academic respectability, as well as the Singularity University, uh, Robin Hansen, um, yeah. Although, although I, I must I must say that's that's a lot less visible from on this side of the pond. So Oxford is a lot. Yeah, you're there. absolutely correct. You're absolutely correct on your side of the pond. That's the way it, it looks. Yeah, I can I can see that. I can see that. And if that's the case, then I think that Nick has a responsibility to be more active and yeah. and not have his own little group as a private group. Yeah. I think Ray Kurzweil needs to do the same thing. I mean, Ray started the Singularity University, so I think there's some issues here. Natasha, I have a question. Yeah. I, I hear you talk about Nick. Are you talking Professor Nick Postrom from Oxford University who runs the Future of Humanity Institute. And so they take a whole bunch of these ideas and others uh, in the philosophy department and do research into uh, sort of the biggest possible risks to the long-term future of humanity. Um, and Dr. Anders Sandberg is one of his, is sort of his right hand, who actually, Nick tends to outsource all the outreach work to. So Anders is the one who goes, who for instance comes to the Netherlands to speak at a conference, so Nick can have a day off and just, you know, put his brain to some more abstractions, which he loves doing at three in the morning. But yeah, he's, <laughs> he's so funny. Yeah. I don't see Anders as a right hand to anyone. Anders <laughs> is, is brilliant. Yeah. Andrew Sandberg, so you all know, is not just the right hand at all. He is a neuroscientist, he's a PhD, and he is, he is I think, one of the leading thinkers yeah, okay. of, of the transhumanist community. Uh, he and Max Moore, I would say, are the leading thinkers of the transhumanist community. Um, as far as grasping knowledge and putting it together, I think another one is certainly um, Damien Broderick. God, there's so many. There's so many. Um, Natasha, 
the, the yeah. reason, the reason yeah, yeah. that I brought up uh, Nick Bostrom mm -hmm. is because he is also known for uh, work and a, a theory that is, uh, I think, yeah. when most people hear it, quite controversial, but yet it is accepted by uh, a normal university. Yeah. And that is uh, taking simulation theory seriously. So thinking seriously and being paid by a university about are we living in some kind of matrix? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, are we already avatars? Yeah. And, and that is being taken seriously in science. Yes, it's in a, a way. It's, it's a serious... And, am I correct? I don't know. Well, <laughs> it's am I correct? Theory. I'm just asking. Um, so I don't know. The, uh, I think from a, when you're in the department of philosophy, it's you have it's like being an artist. You have leeway to explore different okay. ideas. Okay. All right. So yeah. you know, it, it, okay. as a philosopher, you have what do you call it? Artistic license. Yes. yes. Uh, so that puts it in perspective. Uh, huh? That puts it in perspective in a way. Yeah, okay. I think you have. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, now this so this is the philosophy department at Oxford University, so they're expected to be a little bit out there. All right. Yeah, it's not a science department. Yeah. Yeah. And, and and also the department is specifically set up to not have a lot of like teaching obligations and stuff like that. So right. they can purely focus on research. And then yeah, and that's what's great about it, Arjun, is that they have the opportunity just to explore ideas. I mean, wow, could you imagine being paid to explore ideas? Yeah. No, no, and right now, Anders and Nick have two of the best jobs in the world. I, I, I try to drop in on them a couple of times a year just for a day. And just have lunch with them, basically. And yeah, it's I wouldn't say that. I would say Ray Kurzweil has the best job. He's at Google. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, I mean, uh, okay. So then we get into: Do we want to theorize about stuff out there, stuff, or do we want to make stuff? Yeah. Okay. Well, Nick and I was kind of basically to live in a 14th century open air museum and call it home. It's sort of, you know, it's a nice place. You're funny. You're funny. <laughs> I I want things to be. Um, Pragmatic. I want to see it. I, 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 I guess I've spent most of my life theorizing and philosophizing and artistic designing on stuff. It's it's fine, but give me the give me the the reality. I don't have time to waste on this other stuff too much. No, it's, 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 well, the first part of the stuff that's done is just Yeah. yeah. There, there is another question. I think for me. Yeah. yeah, so uh, first maybe because you, you, you were asking about uh, what's the impression of the participants about this, uh, this day. I think it was really great, very interesting. Uh, many speeches really interesting. Uh, I like you uh, speak very much, uh, Natasha. Maybe I have... Oh. I have uh, I'm surprised by one thing, uh, no, two things uh, about what you are saying. First, that you don't think that artificial intelligence is a big risk. I suppose you read already the book of, uh, the, the last book of, this, well, the book of Boston about uh, the dangers of uh, super intelligence. And uh, the second thing where I'm surprised is you say, I don't think I will see life extension in my lifetime. Uh, okay, I'm... I quite agree that if you take a look at uh, the things who happened in the last uh, 10 years, let's say, and if we keep the same rhythm, we will not arrive in our lifetime. Uh, but if we can uh, convince uh, public opinion, and if, if we can convince uh, uh, developments to invest massively, I think that's uh, something possible. And so uh, I'm really convinced that Technological progress is a big part of political, let's say, political choice. So you, when you say uh, I'm not optimist, uh, it's in all cases or it's only it's only change. That that was uh, one uh, question, and maybe the last uh, general remark is. Uh, there are so many big questions we are approaching today, and so many things we are absolutely not sure. It's really very difficult to choose what's the priority, artificial, uh, no, existential risk, uh, life extension, if you choose existential risk, which one? Uh, but uh, also I'm uh, really sometimes, uh, let's say, uh, I don't understand why the uh, most people are not interested in, 
that's kind of a mystery that uh, they are, you cannot imagine bigger questions and most people, they are really not interested. Uh, so why? Do you have an idea? I don't have an idea. Well, maybe, okay, I have a few ideas, but not a real explanation. Why are the people not interested in big questions? I think most people are just surviving. I mean, most people are just thinking how, you know, how to get pregnant, how to get married, how to get a job, how to raise your, their children, how to take care of their parents. I think that most people are just trying to survive on a daily basis and find some joy in life in this, you know, the complexity of the world as it is, with all the different threats that we have at our, you know, at our doors every day. So I think that living longer seems more like, you know, some kind of bonus if you want it, but just to get through the, the daily stuff is, is hard for most people, don't you all? Yeah, I agree. Yeah, I worry every day if I'm gonna have my job tomorrow. <laughs> you know, um, I, I, I think about my health. I have led a glorious life of being healthy all the time, you know, so yeah, I think about that. I'm con concerned about my, my memory, that's why I did my latest research on, on C. elegans and memory and had my scientific breakthrough, which I'm not going to talk about now, but I'll talk about another time. Um, but yeah, I, I, I think most people are just trying to get through, you know? Uh, I don't, I, you know, I have to look at people's lives. Do you, do you, how many children do you have? One. I have uh, one daughter. I have, I have two children. How many does he have I didn't see? One. 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 And um, what if you had five children, and you know you're worried about your losing your job, and you know you're renting an apartment, you want to buy a house, you get a mortgage on something, and and you're worried about the schools no. your children are going to. Uh, then I wouldn't have the time. No. No. Yeah, you wouldn't have the time. So and that's why going back to Arjun, that's why it's so important that people get their life in here. Why maybe it seems that transhumanists early on were selfish. It's just that they were trying to decide, do I want to have a family? Because if I focus on my family, then later on, I may not be able to devote my time doing research. You know, my husband and I made a decision. You know, I lost a, a pregnancy that was tragic to me. Um, but, uh, you know, we thought about it long and hard. And I wanted to have children. And we went through infertility, but we didn't. But it was a, we just talked about adopting. And we decided we couldn't afford to adopt, meaning that my life is based on my research about life extension, human enhancement, the future of humanity. Um, Max, my husband, is a strategic philosopher. He wrote the transhumanist philosophy. He's constantly working. He wrote the morphological freedom. He wrote the proactionary principle. He is you know, a big source of knowledge behind the future and, and you know, ethics and all that stuff. And so we had to decide, do we adopt and have a big family with Thanksgiving dinner and Christmas and, you know, animals and, you know, or do we devote our, our work to our research? We chose the latter. And that may be selfish. My family thinks I'm very selfish. Really? But I don't think I'm selfish. I think I'm giving something which I hope is valuable on some level, you know, no matter how small, some level. So, you know, when we think about what other people think about, they chose a family perhaps or to excel at their career and don't have time to think about life extension. Again, because when you've got five children, even you know, one child, for goodness sakes, it takes a lot of time. Yeah. Uh, so, just, yeah. Just, um, one, just one sentence, you say the average American, uh, the average European is uh, using two hours uh, each day, more or less, to watch TV. So yeah. I, I, yeah. Know, I really not, I'm, I, I'm really not convinced by uh, by this answer, you, we are in a richer world than ever, okay? Dangerous world, but in a richer world than ever, and we have more time than ever. So why don't we have time? Yeah, but it's all relative, isn't it? And people are, are accustomed to this richer world than ever. But it's, it's richness is not monetary, it's time. How much time do you have to devote to uh, things? And what do we do about if everyone is, not everyone, if so many people are overweight and not exercising, why would they think about living longer? Isn't that an oxymoron? I, I think it also helps when you're really healthy, you can think brighter. 
Um, <laughs> Natasha. <laughs> yes. Yeah, right. Uh, and otherwise, literally, in, yeah, in any yeah. other way also, your, your brain is fun. Yeah, you require a lot of sleep and uh, your health and efficiency. No, I, I agree with Ginger. I think it's it's a shame that more people aren't involved in life extension. I wish it was as uh, I wish it wasn't that way, but it's it, if they if they were, they would be. Yeah, but I, I think it's like a snowball rolling up up a hill. And uh, yeah. in the Netherlands, we didn't have a lot of material about this, and we will publish this day on YouTube and on the Singularity Network. So that's yeah. good steps. I would like to thank you because uh, we're going to round it off the day. <laughs> yes, 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 okay. <laughs> But it's really great uh, that you yeah, participated and uh, that you also joined the group discussion. So yes. thank you very much. Thank you much. so much for your presence. Thank you. Good luck with everything. And, 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 and Arjun and Divya, all of you, everyone who participated, I'm, I'm going to be researching your latest work and, and great. You guys are fabulous. Need more of you, and maybe that will solve the problem of why more people aren't interested in life extension. Wow. Yes. Yes. Bye. 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 Bye.